and the anticipation is finally over. The West Virginia Mountaineers are hosting the Penn State Nittany Lions to open up the 2024 season. Penn State's first trip to Morgantown in well over three decades, 92 to be exact. Mike Osti, Ethan Bach here. This is another edition of Mountaineer Report brought to you by WV Sports Now. And you also see if you're watching this on video, you also hear him in a moment. If you're just listening on audio, Joe Smeltzer, who is our lead reporter for Nittany Sports Now within our Sports Now family of networks. And we are going to preview West Virginia, Penn State, big noon kickoff, and get Joe's take on the Nittany Lions to combine with what Ethan and I have been talking about leading up into this game from the West Virginia perspective. Ethan, you and I have talked about how it feels like this has been a three-year-long offseason and this game is finally here and just put up or shut up and all the talking gets to end and we get to actually see what these two teams are made of on the field. So, Joe, I kind of want to ask you then, what's the vibe in State College around Penn State, players, coaches, even your colleagues covering Penn State leading up into this game? Because obviously this will be a big deal for West Virginia to win it. They haven't won too many of these in the history of this kind of rivalry. And Penn State has a lot in front of them too, but this isn't really the biggest game Penn State's going to play this year. So there's a little different perspective going into this for the Nittany Lions, but also a game they they have to win as well. Yeah, and uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Um, I would say the vibe right now around Penn State is pretty positive. You know, I think the 12-team playoff is obviously the biggest difference around college football this season. But for Penn State, it's hard to argue that there's been another program that benefits from or should benefit from this expanded playoff more than Penn State has. You look at six of the last eight seasons, Penn State never made the 14 playoff, but six of the past eight, they would have been in with this 12 team format. Now that um, I don't know if I would call it an excuse, but it's a simple fact that James Franklin was hurt by the playoff only being four teams. That doesn't really get to be used for for the defense of James Franklin in the program this season, I don't think. So I think that puts a little more pressure, but it also creates a greater opportunity uh, for Penn State to get into the college football playoff, especially considering I don't think Penn State has an easy schedule. I think opening up on the road against the Power 5 team that won nine games and should have won ten games uh, last season is a good example uh, that Penn State does have a challenging road overall but at the same time you're in the big 10 you don't play oregon you don't play michigan those are two teams that along with penn state and ohio state could very well get into that 12 team field and oregon in particular is a team that many feel along with ohio state could win a national title so not avoiding those two teams is big uh talking about personnel it hurts to lose guys like olu fashionu and Caden Wallace and Theo Johnson on offense, Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac defensively, Kalen King too. But there's still a lot of talent coming back, especially looking at this class of 2022, which um, if you guys remember going back, that was a very, maybe the most celebrated class Penn State's ever had. And now they're all in year three right. for a lot of them. It's going to be their last crack at winning the Big Ten, last crack at getting to the playoffs playing for a national title, et cetera. So this is when that really comes into uh, fruition. I think Andy Cuddle-Nicky offensively uh, is a game changer, and not only just for his scheme and what he could do, but just his personality. It's pretty much the polar opposite of Mike Yurcich, and I think that's created a lot of good feelings um, around the Penn State offense. And then defensively, Penn State's always good defensively, and Tom Allen is a established defensive football coach. So I think people are just kind of expecting more of the same uh, for Penn State on defense. So overall, um, the vibe is uh, pretty solid, and the main reason for that is probably the playoff expanding from 14 to 12. Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine it's a really big deal to go from 4 to 12. I think, what, six times they would have been in if, yep. if there were, was a 12-team playoff, and Joel Klatt mentioned exactly what you're talking about of – this is the 2022 class that Penn State had been hyping up, that Penn State was so confident in, that Penn State's still been talking about, that we all covered here um, in your early days with sports now. Here it is. Like, it's that group, as talented as they've been in recent years, it's that group now that will lead them this year. Before I go to Ethan, anything else on the West Virginia game 
obviously there's a lot of excitement of this year. Now you have a 12 team playoff. You don't have to play a couple teams that may win a national title, but you still have the house on schedule. And we all know they're going to be judged by what happens against Ohio state more so than against West Virginia. Cause Penn state has won the games they're favored in and not won games they're underdog in. They are a favorite in this game, despite being on the road, but any extra conversation that it is West Virginia and it's not Villanova, it's not Delaware. It was West Virginia last year. Obviously, Penn State won big last year, but this is a historic program despite not being on Penn State's level. This is the 15th winningest program. This is a program they did play a lot back in the day. Does that add anything to this for you, or, or is this feeling like this is more from the West Virginia perspective of wanting to get this big win and Penn State's just looking at this as another game? Yeah, that's a good question, and I definitely think that there's a lot more intrigue uh, with this opener uh, compared to some of the openers uh, Penn State's had in the past, including last year's opener, because obviously last year right. it was exciting to have West Virginia playing Penn State for the first time in more than three decades, but at the same time, uh, yeah. West Virginia, the main storyline, one of the main storylines anyway, was is Neil Brown even going to keep his job going in the 2024? They weren't, people weren't thinking, you know, <laughs> Big 12, uh, Big 12 dark horse, double digit wins. Right. They, right. Meanwhile, Penn State, obviously, the expectations were last year as they are this year of kind of getting in that national championship mix. So I think this year yeah. with West Virginia surprising a lot of people last season with Garrett Green. Jaheim White, C.J. Donaldson, and frankly, a lot of talent coming back. And with the game being in Morgantown, I think, yeah, there's definitely um, a lot more intrigue. And I think you're even noticing that in the reporters' questions for Penn State. Usually, uh, the questions are tailored uh, towards just Penn State-specific, and people don't ask uh, really about the opposing <laughs> team unless it's Ohio State and Michigan. But this week... Right. You're getting some questions. That's interesting. That's interesting. I thought Ethan a little smirking there. That's kind of interesting. That feeds into what Garnet Hall has talked about, that they yeah. maybe overlook some opponents, maybe not looking overlooking West Virginia as a week one opponent. In terms of week one opponents, this is tougher than a lot of major programs are going to be dealing with, certainly than what the other programs Penn State usually is behind in the conference uh, are dealing with in, in week one for sure. Yeah, Joe, just like adding more on the playoff expansion, like now it's a totally different game because if one of these teams lost this week in a four-team playoff, they're probably looking outside in for most of the right. season. But now if one of these teams lose or when one of these teams lose, they're still in contention, um, especially West Virginia who could win an easier conference and get that automatic bid. So just how crucial is this game to Penn State when you look at their conference schedule, um, like how crucial is it for them when, especially when they're fighting for that at large bid? Yeah, Ethan, it's still a big deal. Definitely. Uh, as you mentioned uh, last year uh, in this situation, if Penn state loses at West Virginia, that's pretty much the death knell for their playoff chances, I think. And this year they'd still definitely be in control of their own destiny. I think theoretically, uh, Penn State, if Penn State goes 11 and 1, they're in the college football playoff. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that, especially in that yeah. scenario. A loss to West Virginia going 11 and 1 would still win you to Big Ten. Um, and a loss on the road. It would be last year was home. Mm -hmm. A loss on the road, uh, maybe that's a little different. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, still, you lose to West Virginia. I think uh, you can yeah. never assume a win against Ohio State, obviously. So uh, counting that as an expected <laughs> loss. Uh, that means you got to beat one of USC or Wisconsin uh, on the road to get into the college football playoff. And that's not going to be easy, especially um, we'll talk about the USC matchup on a mini sports. Now uh, definitely further down the line, that's scheduled for October 12th, but uh, yeah. that matchup is going to present a lot of problems. I think for Penn state with Lincoln Riley's offense. And if USC finally learns how to play defense a little bit, which <laughs> is with uh, Penn State grad uh, Dan Lynn at the helm as defensive coordinator, I think they might actually surprise some people defensively. So that's not going to be easy. Yeah. But uh, losing to West Virginia, Penn State would still be in theory in control of its own destiny. But that makes one of those games, Ohio, uh, sorry, Wisconsin and USC, a must win. Uh, and that's not a situation you want to be in, especially – depending on how Penn State look, looks, losing to West Virginia could be a yeah. sign of things to come and not in a good way. Yeah, Penn State, <laughs> James Franklin and Penn State, do they feel pressure to win this game? Like, 
especially going on the road. Penn State rarely opens the season on the road, especially against a power five. <laughs> That's um, true. Yeah. The pressure on James Franklin, just his coaching, just his job in general. Does he, does he sense any pressure with this game? Um, I think there's definitely uh, the pressure that you would expect uh, in a big game week one. And uh, what helps Penn State is they've had uh, kind of big time opening week uh, matchups before in recent years. Uh, going back, um, obviously, last year's game was a bigger deal than normal with it being on NBC and against a former regional rival. Uh, and then 2021, you opened up in Madison against Wisconsin. 2022, open up at Purdue uh, under the lights and then. 2020 at Indiana, Penn, I'll spare Penn State fans uh, any memories of that game because that's still a sore subject with Michael Penix and all that. But, yeah, I think that experience helps. And um, as far as uh, the big picture goes, um, this season with James Franklin, I, will, I don't really see a scenario where Penn State – where they end the year on the hot seat uh, with James Franklin, I think for that to even be a conversation, you got to go seven and five, maybe eight and four. Uh, then maybe uh, the fire Franklin people would actually have a <laughs> lot of ammunition, which I don't think they have now. And I'm not expecting them right. to at season's end, but um, I definitely feel that this is a situation that the Penn State's coaches and really some of its players um, are familiar with. And that's because uh they opened on the road in the Big Ten week one um, a few times uh, in recent years, and that's something that um, James Franklin and Pat Kraft have been openly against, and this year they're finally opening the conference season at home against Illinois. Uh, but overall, I think those experiences in the past, winning at Wisconsin, winning at Purdue, both of those games came down to the final minute. Um, I think that that experience is definitely beneficial in what's going to be a pretty similar uh Similar situation week one, especially since both of those games were on Fox as well. Yeah. Mike Oste, Ethan Bach here, Mountaineer Report. Joe Smeltzer of Nittany Sports now joining us as we are previewing West Virginia hosting Penn State to open up the 2024 season. And all the pressure is kind of on Penn State, regardless of whether that will lead Franklin to being in the hot seat or not. West Virginia is not supposed to win this game. If they lose this game, their season's definitely not over. And really, as Joe brought up, neither would Penn State be as it would have been the case last year. This 12-team playoff does open up the door, and Ethan and I have talked about this a lot. The rules are the rules, and West Virginia could lose to both Pitt and Penn State, and if they win the Big 12, which they still could do, they then get an automatic bid. And Joe, there could be a funky scenario where Penn State beats West Virginia by even two touchdowns, and if West Virginia rolls the Big 12 and wins an easier conference, they're a four seed at worst. Penn State's not in despite a head-to-head -head win. I mean, get ready for social media when that occurs. That that could happen, potentially, and, and we will definitely see. And I, I also would imagine, Joe, you may want to tell Penn State fans after the game, even with a victory over West Virginia for Penn State, Penn State fans are going to need to be pretty big West Virginia fans the rest of the year. Because, yep. you like last year, West Virginia becoming a nine-win team and winning a bowl – that helped out Penn State in the final rankings because they could say that's a quality win and a big one to open up the season. And if West Virginia wins the Big 12 or even gets eight-plus wins, flirts with top 25 like they're getting votes now, that is where Penn State can say, well, we didn't play Michigan this year, but we did beat West Virginia, who's not Michigan, but they're a ranked team. Like, they would want West Virginia to get in that top 25 yeah. and the coaches poll when that comes out, I think Franklin might want to switch his vote up and throw some West Virginia's way after the game, because th that's going to be a big deal. As Mike, I've always, I've been saying it all off season. It's like now we're yeah. creeping closer to college basketball resume talk when it this comes gonna, to. Like, yeah. The Ethan, I think volunteering himself to do some bracketology for us here. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're going to need to do some Ken Palm bracketology, the quality win, the quality loss. This will be a quality loss for West Virginia potentially, and will you're going to want all your win? you're going to want yeah. your non cons to win eight plus games all hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean that that yeah. that is the thing. Penn State is going to going to need to really root for West Virginia after the game. I do want to flip it into a little bit more inside the players and inside the game here, outside of the conversation about you know, West Virginia feeling slighted and then even talking about the final seconds of, of last year's game, which maybe we'll get into, but we probably don't need to talk about anymore. It's pretty, pretty clear, no matter what Neil Brown says, 
West Virginia players are kind of in their feelings about it. I do get it. Ethan and I have discussed before that, hey, if you need style points because you're not going to be a conference champ, you'd want to win by two touchdowns versus one. Like that probably will happen again. That's what Franklin always does. You do need to beef up how the wins look. But on to Drew Aller, Joe, because he is the other polarizing conversation that exists. He might honestly be the most polarizing player in the country. And in addition to Penn State fans saying, well, Franklin beats all the teams he's supposed to beat and loses as an underdog, 10 wins doesn't mean as much as it used to. That kind of was the conversation around Aller last year. He looked great against West Virginia, but then against Michigan, Ohio State, you didn't get near that same player. And he had a year that was fine, as Neil Brown even defended him, but it wasn't to this elite level that maybe he was hyped up to be. What do you expect from Drew Aller this year? What's the vibe around Drew Aller? What's the conversation surrounding Drew Aller from the Penn State perspective entering this season? And there's so much about Garrett Green's going to be even better. What do you expect from Drew Aller? Will he be even better coming into this year? I think so. And I think a lot of it, uh, Mike, is going to depend on uh, how uh, he translates uh, to Andy Kotelnicki and what the new offensive coordinator wants to do. I think, um, and James Franklin has even said this, that if you look at what uh, Kotelnicki did at Kansas, uh, which you two uh, got to see over the past few years, um, that 2022 game uh, in particular is one that uh, West Virginia, <laughs> um, West Virginia fans probably don't want to think about. But um, the what Colonel Nicky did at Kansas and the quarterbacks he had, they more suited the style of Bo Pribula, who's going to be Drew Hours backup, but not really a traditional backup. And that I think you're going to see Bo Pribula quite a bit throughout the season. And I assume you would see him Saturday in week one too, because Andy Colonel Nicky likes mobile quarterbacks and likes to use two quarterbacks. But um, James Franklin also mentioned, and he gave me a somewhat extensive answer um, when I asked him a Bo Pribula tailored question as to how, uh, Prebula's skill set suits what Andy Kettle Nicky wants to do. And Franklin said that over 19 years, Kettle Nicky has shown that he can adapt uh, what he does to the strengths of his players. So if he's able to adapt um, okay. what he yeah. really hasn't had to deal with, and that's a, a pure pocket passer in Drew Hour, if he can adapt his play calling to tailor to what Drew Hour is capable of doing as a kind of a pro style pocket passer uh Penn State's going to be all right and I think that as far as Drew Hour specifically goes uh from what his teammates have been saying uh, he's definitely uh using his voice more he's improved as a leader um Drew talked with uh Penn State reporters I wasn't in state college for this but earlier in camp I want to say about two weeks ago uh, he talked about uh one of the things that Penn State's focused on is being able to kind of wash a play away when a bad play happens, move on to the next play. And that's something uh, that drew us. Uh, he struggled with uh, last season and um, going against um, a defense. that's going to be one of the best in the country. Uh, Drew's um, I'm sure made plenty of mistakes um, in practice. And even when you're a guy with that type of mindset, a division one quarterback mistakes in practice could get to you as well. And if you're able yeah. um, to make more mistakes in practice because of your competition and able to wash those away on the practice field, obviously it's not the same as doing it in front of uh, Saturday, 60,000 plus people. And a lot of Saturdays, a hundred thousand plus people. Um, it's not, it's not the same animal, but if you're able to kind of wash those mistakes away um, throughout camp, uh, that could translate well and make Drew Hour a better quarterback. So I think you're going to see um, a better leader. Obviously, he's another year older. He ha- has 13 college starts under his belt. Uh, he's playing for a renowned offensive coordinator. And as long as um, those two um, are able to be a dynamic pairing, um, I think that Penn State's offense could be in pretty good shape and Drew Hour would be at the center of that. And then just on the defensive side, Joe, how do you think Penn State's defense fares with uh, the run game with Garrett Green, Jaheim White, C.J. Donaldson, and just honestly West Virginia's offense in general because Mike and I have talked about it for a while. I don't think there's a necessary uh, wide receiver one for sure. Cole Taylor is going to be that red zone reception target, but um, just how do you think Penn State's defense fares against the run game first and then just overall? Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I think one thing that plays to Penn State's advantage um, in this case is 
Penn State's defense goes against uh, two dynamic running backs uh, pretty frequently, right, with Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen. And now um, they're facing another two-headed monster in C.J. Donaldson and Jaheim White, who Jaheim White didn't didn't touch the ball at Penn State last season. So that's a guy that yeah. they don't have the experience <laughs> of uh, playing against. So I think uh, that could be very interesting. Uh, but um, overall, I would I would say that, just the experience of facing uh, Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen is going to prepare Penn State well uh, defensively uh, for pretty much any running game uh, it goes against. But what Penn State doesn't um, face, at least not on the first team, Bro Prebula is a mobile quarterback, but he's on the second team. West Virginia's QB1 is a guy that is one of the better dual threat options in the country. He ran for more than 70 yards against Penn State last season, uh, and that was before he had established himself really as a formidable starting quarterback in the Big 12. Now Garrett Green, like Drew Auer, he's another year older. Um, I'm sure his confidence is a lot higher than it was uh, going into Beaver Stadium week one last season, and uh, that's the type of threat that Penn State's uh, not going to have to face uh, too often, and um, how the yeah. defense adapts to Garrett Green and how well Garrett Green is able to uh, handle facing what's probably going to be the best. I think I could safely say this is going to be the best uh, unit West Virginia sees all season. Um, I think that matchup uh, could be a big key in uh, determining what happens Saturday. Yeah, and, and to that point, you mentioned Penn State avoiding playing Michigan. West Virginia doesn't play Utah. So if you think Utah is the top dog that the preseason pick to win the Big 12, West Virginia does avoid Utah. They also avoid Colorado, no matter what you think of Colorado. So I don't get to talk to Dion. I'm kind of a little upset about that. Uh, this this year, Ethan Bach, Mike Ossie here, Joe Smeltzer from Nittany Sports Now, is a Mountaineer Report talking West Virginia, Penn State to open up the 2024 season. It also sounds like, Joe, that maybe a kind of underrated advantage that Penn State has is they do have a – coach who just had the Kansas offense and just had Daniels there and a very similar QB and a very similar mindset and a very similar system to what West Virginia is doing with Garrett Green. So that's not something that Drew Aller necessarily can mirror for their defense in practice. And they don't necessarily want to give too many reps to the backup, but the coach can say, this is what Garrett Green's probably going to do here. This is when Garrett Green would do this in meetings. He probably <laughs> is a real asset to have because he's pretty much scheming for a player that he kind of coached before. Garrett Green and Daniels would be very similar guys. Yeah, and that's a great point, Mike. And um, people, I think, uh, sometimes overlook that to be a good offensive coordinator, you kind of have to know a lot about defensive football too, right? Sure. And yeah. um, you mentioned, obviously, Andy Kotelnicki's a familiarity uh, with uh, what West Virginia does offensively. Obviously, uh Graham Harrell wasn't there um, last season. There was a kind of new system last season, but um, yeah. at, to your point, he knows about uh, Garrett Green and he knows about kind of Garrett Green style of quarterback having coached Jalen Daniels and um, that mobile style um, at Kansas. Uh, so yeah, obviously, Cole Nicky's focused mainly on working with uh, the quarterbacks, uh, working with the offense, and preparing for what West Virginia's defense is going to do. But I would definitely. Um, I would assume that he's also been uh, talking with uh, defensive coordinator Tom Allen and James Franklin about uh, what to expect uh, from Garrett Green and that style of quarterback. Because even though Penn State did face Garrett Green last season, it was with a different defensive coordinator and probably in many ways a different Garrett Green too. Yeah, different Garrett Green, no Jaheim White, a different West Virginia offense. I mean, a, a name Cortez Braham was a top three receiver at that point for West Virginia, and that ended up unraveling in drama, and he's no longer there. I mean, you could argue the West Virginia offense is a lot different. Traylon Ray, you mentioned, or, or I met, I'll mention, he also didn't get time. You mentioned Jaheim White didn't get time. No one heard of Penn State didn't have to scheme against Traylon Ray in that game. There was no Day Day Farmer. Obviously, he's a freshman for West Virginia now. We don't know how much he'll be used against Penn State, obviously, but – there's a lot of differences. And even Justin Rob Ethan brought up the red zone and Cole Taylor being the number one red zone guy. That was West Virginia's main problem last year. They could score on big plays, but they couldn't really score in the red zone as much as they, they should. And they won nine games anyway. But it's not just Cole Taylor now. It's Justin Robinson and Jaden Bray, who is from Oklahoma State, who has had conference championship game experience under his belt, he's now on the Mountaineers as well. So there's a lot of different options and arguably more weapons and a more potent offense than what the Mountaineers had last year. 
And if you look at what West Virginia did against Penn State, even though 38-15 was the final, they probably did better than Penn State, or certainly some Penn State fans thought maybe they would have. We know that last touchdown was scored in the final six seconds. West Virginia would have covered the spread without it, which is why it's such a talking point now. And 15 points doesn't sound like that much, Joe, but I'd imagine, I mean, I guess I'll ask you that in terms of that conversation from last year and just the vibe now. Does does Do you feel like Penn State, in their heart of hearts, looks at West Virginia as a formidable foe or a team that if they lost, it would they would be shell-shocked? Like, do, do you think there's any type of, James Franklin calling it a hornet's nest they're going into, is that coach speak or do you think Franklin's sitting down thinking, this team could beat me. They were, they were 20 points away last year. They're way better now. You know, maybe, maybe this will be a closer game. Do you think any of that exists or or that's coach speak? Yeah. As far as the Hornets nets comment on Mike, I definitely don't think that's coach speak. I think James Franklin met that because he's been in it before. Uh, He coached there. I think three or four times uh, when he was at Maryland and he was coaching at Maryland in the early two thousands when that was yeah. still um, an annual uh, rivalry, which unfortunately it isn't anymore. So I think that uh, James Franklin knows about Morgantown and knows about that hostile environment. As far as the players go, um, I do think they see West Virginia as a formidable opponent. I think that one thing Penn State does very well is not overlook anybody. I think you look at last season uh, is a perfect example. Just- so you disagree with Garnett Hollis. They don't- <laughs> that was exactly what he said. I do disagree with that because you got, you got to look at what happened last season. Penn State, yeah. hard to say they don't take anybody but Ohio State and Michigan seriously when they beat everybody but Ohio State and Michigan. 100%, I think, yeah. <laughs> I, think that's, um, I think that's a little um, interesting. Uh, but, yeah, I think Penn State is going to be well-prepared, especially this being week one. It's, it's hard for a team, I think, to overlook, and this plays to Penn State's advantage, to overlook their week one opponent because no matter who yeah. you're playing, this is a game – you wait uh, months and months for, and what feels like years and years for. Um, but <laughs> you asked if uh, you asked if they would be shell shocked. Um, I think they would be. Um, I think for this team to start zero and one after being ranked in the top ten in the preseason, after finishing in the top ten in 2022, finishing the regular season in the top ten in 2023, losing the Ole Miss and the Peach Bowl changed that, but still a ten and three season, and with. Um, so much put into this 2022 class and uh, expanded yeah. playoff and a new offensive coordinator. I think starting 0-1 would come as a big shock um, to uh, Penn State's uh, team as a whole. So um, I don't think West Virginia is being overlooked, um, but I, I don't think uh, the thought of losing um, is really in Penn State's minds either, if that makes sense. Yeah. Joe, what's just to kind of a little bit off the game for a second, just to kind of get a – just to get a better answer, just what's what would be a disappointing season for Penn State overall? Would it like is making the playoff and losing right away? Is that a disappointment, or is it just flat out missing the playoff? What's a disappointment for Penn State? Um, well, there, there's a lot of factors on me from that could happen during a season. Like for example, if Penn State makes the playoff, loses a game, but Drew Hour missed half the season, I think people would look at that. As a success, if Penn State goes nine and three, misses the playoffs, uh, but plays the whole season without not the whole season. Well, assu- assuming Drew Haller's health, I yeah, guess, like to, off of what Ethan's question, assuming nobody gets hurt, mm-hmm. assuming there's no suspension or major scandal or nothing erupts that's all funky and ass nine, which I know someone's going to happen to some program this year, but assuming regular play occurs, yes. does Penn State, I, I, I'll even ask it a better way, does Penn State have yeah. to get in the playoff? for this to be a successful year, or if they don't get in because now it's a 12 team playoff and they would have been in six times when it was four, is that a situation where even if Franklin's not fired, it's an off season of a funeral atmosphere. The vibes are bad. The fans are mad. Is it playoff or bust? You got to get in. Yes. Um, assuming, as you said, everybody's healthy and there aren't any um, outside uh, distractions uh, that would affect the team's play. Yeah, I definitely think it's playoff or bust. Uh, and I'd even go a step further, Mike and Ethan. I would say that uh, Penn State has to win at least one game in the postseason okay. because um, if they make the playoff and don't win, then you're basically accomplishing something you've already accomplished a bunch of times in the past eight seasons. Like 
where is yeah. the step forward there? Where is the progress? If you end, if you go 10 and two and then lose to a very good team in your first playoff game, Penn State mm-hmm. went 10 and two and lost to a very good team in the Peach Bowl last season. Where's the progress <laughs> there? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I definitely feel that uh, Penn yeah. State not only making the playoff is the bare minimum, and um, I think uh, you got to win at least one game, uh, too, for people to really feel like this 2024 season was a step forward for Penn State. Yeah, it's such a high bar, and this this is why I've said for a while now, and you're saying the vibes are good and everyone's happy, and I get that. You're going into week one. It is a big game, even though they're going on the road. I feel like there's such an angst and pressure around James Franklin, Drew Hour, and the entire Penn State program that it, it's almost not fun to be around. Like I, it, it's it's almost like the entire season's waiting for the Ohio State game, and if Penn State doesn't win that game, then every, the whole conversation is going to be, well, we don't play Michigan, but it's the same as every other year. We can't beat the top dogs, but we can beat everybody else. And then even if that gets you in the playoff, then as you're saying, people are going to say, well, we we didn't have a playoff, but we were ranked inside the top twelve most of these other years. And if it doesn't get in. I don't think any Penn State fan is going to want to hear, well, now it's a bigger Big Ten conference. You have more stored programs in there. It's a harder conference. The fans are going to say, we don't care. You told us we can be an elite program and win this. We got to try to get in. So I, it's almost it, – all of that makes it seem like for a Penn State fan, this wouldn't be that fun. Like, unless you're rolling a schedule, there's there got to be a lot of angst and pressure and uh, a lot of nervousness every week. Whereas, like, in contrast, last year with West Virginia only predicted to win four games, even though they should have won 10 or they should have won 11 and they did blow games, winning nine was allowing a parade at a bowl game, which is a bowl game that's below the standard of past bowl wins in the program. That doesn't exist at Penn State. Like, if they're in the Dukes-Mayo Bowl, um, Franklin might have to move. Like that, I feel like that's the situation. Um, Joe here, I, I do want to – I do want to ask you an X factor or a key you have to this game. Outside of obviously Drew Aller playing well and all the pressure and Penn State's supposed to win, but what do you think is an X factor in this game? Is it the running backs somehow slashing maybe a questionable West Virginia defensive line that's under some pressure? Do you think Drew Aller is going to try to pick apart a West Virginia secondary that was better than people thought last year that maybe is deeper this year? Maybe Garnet Hollis is going to face uh, some 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 things in his direction after some comments he made. What, what's what's an X factor or something for fans to watch in this game to, to lead Penn State to a victory in in their efforts? Yeah, Mike, you mentioned the running backs. Um, I'm very interested to see the differences uh, there because going back to when Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen signed with Penn State, the thought was, and this is what played out in 2022 when they were both true freshmen, is that Nicholas Singleton was the fast guy uh, that was going to get an edge and go for 70, 80 yards, while Nick, while Catron Allen was the guy that uh, was going to get the ball and, you know, good luck tackling me, I'm going to run you over. But now, yeah. Catron Allen is six pounds lighter than Nicholas Singleton. So does that mean that Singleton has built enough muscle to where now he's more of a power back, which I think he tried to do to his detriment last season. Um, Does that mean that Catron Allen is going to be used more as a receiver? Who knows? We'll start to see that week one, but as far as the next factor goes, um, I got to look at Trey Wallace. Uh, Trey Wallace was a guy, uh, Mike, you were there last year, um, he had, I think, above 70 yards uh, receiving uh, in week one, and people thought that he was primed uh, for a big year. Unfortunately, because of injuries, he only ended up playing about half the season, and it didn't turn out that way. But now, yeah. not only is he back healthy, not only is he projected to start, the word around camp is that Trey Wallace is expected to be Penn State's number one receiver, whereas a few months ago, Julian Fleming would have been projected to be that guy. Okay. So. Um, I think uh, we're going to see if Trey Wallace is really that good uh, when healthy because the West Virginia game last season is the only big game he's really put together at Penn State, and a lot of that's not his fault. Uh, But uh, if Trey Wallace is that number one receiver, um, he's – Saturday's a great chance to show it, right, Um, on a big stage um, against a team that you're familiar with, against um, a defense that I don't think West Virginia is bad defensively, but it's a defense that could be exploited um, by a receiver that really is all that. Um, I think it's going to be a big day for Trey Wallace, and I think if they can neutralize Trey Wallace, that's a good sign that West Virginia can neutralize Penn State's receiving core and thus 
neutralize Drew Hour and really that whole offense. But if Trey Wallace is able to go off, uh, it could be a pretty, pretty long day for West Virginia. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the question always around Penn State is, do they have a top flight receiver? Do they have a true wide receiver one? Why haven't they recruited better at the wide receiver position? Even connecting the two programs, they actually tried to bring in Devin Carter before last year to be a veteran to pick something up. He flipped and went to West Virginia, and then, as Ethan and I know, disappointed there. So Penn State's probably happy not to have had him. Uh, nothing against him, but he wasn't that number wide receiver one that he was hoping to be. But does Penn State have that guy? I mean, they've sent receivers to the NFL, but when you're comparing Penn State trying to get to the level of Ohio State, when's the last time they had a Marvin Harrison Jr.? Like, do you have that player to pair with the five-star QB to win a national title versus just getting in a major bowl game or being ranked 12th and barely getting in the playoff or on the outskirts or even if you're hosting one at eight? Do you win a Big Ten without that guy? And maybe, as Joe was alluding to, maybe they have somebody that got hurt a lot of last year so wasn't able to be seen. Ethan, you have anything else for Joe? And then we, we're going to make some picks here before we wrap this up. Uh, I actually had like a betting question for Joe. Okay. Uh, I'm curious, just like why, like, I don't picture Joe, Joe as a better, think... but, but, <laughs> but I'm excited. Well, I'm just, it, it will kind of tie into like a preview. <laughs> Joe, why do you think the spread has just trickled down? It started at about 12, maybe in the spring. And then now it went from 10 a couple weeks ago. Now we're down to Penn state's favorite by eight. Uh, it, why do you think people are buying into West Virginia and is it, or is it more so are people just betting against Penn state? Yeah. Um, I think if I knew the full answer for that question, um, I'd probably, <laughs> probably be making a lot more money uh, than I am right now. I'd probably be a bookie somewhere, but, sure. um, no, I would say, uh, <laughs> just, uh, just from, uh, just from the outs, at least from the outside of the, uh, sports betting world. Um, I think that that 12 point spread initially, that was a little too high to begin with. I remember seeing that in late April, early May and thinking, uh, because just because a team could win by two touchdowns, which I think Penn state could, that doesn't necessarily mean a two yeah. touchdown spread is warranted. Uh, same thing. If Ohio state is favored by two touchdowns at Penn state, I think that's going to be, a pretty absurd uh, spread, even though Ohio State is capable of probably beating anybody in the country uh, by two touchdowns. But um, I think it's maybe just a natural uh, regression to where the spread should be, because I think uh, Penn State being, um, I think the last I saw was a seven and a half point favorite. I think that's about that's about right, especially on the road, because, uh, you know, the home team obviously gets three points. Uh, so it's really more like a double digit uh, spread. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I think the spread right now um, is about where it should be. Um, why, why it is that way, uh, I, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be hard to answer. Uh, maybe people are um, higher on West Virginia since, uh, since the first line uh, was released uh, towards the end of spring practice, maybe a little after spring practice. Um, as far as Penn State goes, um, there's no really uh, big injuries uh, going on right now. You have a few guys, as usual, um, that are hurt. Uh, Zariah Fisher has been banged up. Uh, Keon Wiley, uh, Jackson Smolik, the third string quarterback. And most recently, we found out, Dan Tranglin told us yesterday, that Caden Saunders, who is a receiver, but uh, if you see him Saturday, you're going to see him more often as Penn State's number one punt returner, most likely. He's been dealing with some bumps and bruises, and they're hopeful that he can go in Morgantown. But uh, there's no real big names uh, that are on the mend uh, for Penn State. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with Drew Hour, nothing wrong with the running backs. The tight ends are fine. Uh, the offensive line, even though they have to replace three starters, every, their best healthy options are still there. And then defensively, the health is holding yeah. up uh, pretty well, too. So um, as far as uh, any, like – intel that people might have on penn state uh, i'm not <laughs> sure but uh but but yeah i i think that uh penn state um is overall healthy and as the widest spread went down uh i'm not sure my best guess is that it was probably a little too high a few months ago and now it's kind of regressing to where it should be probably it probably is where it should be what 16 and a half i think is what it was last year and then again that six second yeah. touchdown is why west virginia didn't beat the spread in the jokes of I think Joe, James Franklin had some money on the game uh, to, to make sure that that was screwed up. Uh, I know a lot of people actually that did uh, lose some money because that, that was such a big spread, even on the road, that people were throwing money at West Virginia last minute. And then Franklin said, nope, 
six seconds left and then scored that final touchdown to make make the win look a little bigger. I actually asked Neil Brown this just just yesterday from us recording this show now. So on his Monday on his Monday presser and he just threw it back to it being a home game and people realize that, you you know, you got to throw three more points at the home team versus what a spread is and kind of coming back to the mean. He thought the 12 and a half, of course, was another slight. It is funny. Uh, Joe, I'm sure you've heard this from a distance. The entire theme of the offseason for the Mountaineers is they're underrated, uh, you know, historically. They're undervalued historically. They're undervalued currently. Everyone's getting slighted. Nothing's fair. That's a whole song and dance of this offseason. Some of it, I think there's validity. Some of it does get annoying for sure to cover. But it's funny because you hear all of that. And then two days later, a spread drops from 12 to eight and a half in like a two day swing. Ethan and Joe, I don't know if Neil Brown is the one who has influence in all of this. Because every time Neil Brown says something about someone getting slighted, he goes on, on Marty and McGee, says everyone's getting slighted. They missed the ESPN list. The next day, Garrett Green's on every watch list in America. Uh, he says the program's historically undervalued, uh, currently underrated. And then three days later, a spread goes from 12 and a half all the way below eight. Are people listening to Brown? <laughs> I don't know. And the second he talks things flip around. So I, I don't know what kind of influence he has, but that might be the the, the better um, answer is Neil Brown's involved uh, in, in some way. Before we give our picks, well, actually, no, we'll give our picks first. So we, we're we going to release this in WV Sports now, so we can give it now because we, maybe we'll release the show after that. Ethan, what is, do you have a score pick for this? Are you going Mountaineers in an upset and throw it on the sports page with 1984, 1988, 2024? Are you not going to go out on that limb? No, I, I've got I've got the I've got Penn State winning 34-24. I think West Virginia okay. uh, keeps it competitive at least through two and a half, maybe three quarters. They could okay. even have it close in the fourth. I just think Penn State just escapes at the end. Um, they cover the spread then. Them. They cover the yeah. current spread, but not the past spread. That wouldn't I think be twelve. The, and I half. think the spread. I think the spread should have been nine and a half, ten and a half. Penn State. Right. Okay. I also do think, and this might get boring, I do think Penn State's going to win this game as well. I also do think West Virginia is going to hang in this and make this more competitive than last year, regardless of what the score shows. I think this game will leave with people thinking West Virginia is a Big 12 contender. We'll see what they do the rest of the year. And I do think Frame Franklin maybe will wipe some, wipe some sweat off his brow about the Hornets' nest. It is not a night game, but it's going to be a very rowdy atmosphere. And it will be a very tough place to play to open up a year for Penn State, even bringing up Indiana, things like that. The atmosphere in Morgantown is going to be different than playing Indiana, even though that's a conference game to open up a year. But I do think Penn, Penn State just a more talented, better team. So I do think Penn State's going to still win. Probably, and points are definitely going to have to be on the board here. Maybe 42... 34, I could maybe see that would actually beat that any of those spreads that we mentioned. I could even see 42 32 kind of going with, with Ethan's neighborhood here. Uh, I would I'll probably land there 42 32, maybe give it a 10 point win. But I think there's going to be a lot of scoring early on. I think both teams are going to try to go deep early on, try to have a big play early on. That is what happened last year. And, and I think West Virginia is going to hang in this more because out of all these players that we talked about, Jaheim White, Traylon Ray, et cetera, they weren't factors last year where they really didn't play at all. There's more to go at Penn State this year. West Virginia has more at their disposal now and, and a more confident Garrett Green. I don't think he's going to be throwing picks or anything like that. I don't think he's going to be single-handedly messing up the game or playing way out of sorts. I just think Penn State's going to overpower and, and be the better team. Joe, what do you what do you have? Score and, and winner. Are you gonna be the West Virginia upset pick or are you gonna, are you gonna no. have Penn State winning this? No, I got Penn State too. Uh by a similar margin, maybe a slightly different score. Um, I'll go 31 20. I think uh okay. for West Virginia uh to upset uh Penn State, uh two things have to happen. First is they they have to catch Penn State uh kind of sleepwalking early. The first free, the only free road uh noon games Penn State had last season. At Illinois, at Northwestern, and at Ohio State. They won two of those games against Illinois and Northwestern, but started slow in both of those games. Ohio State, they started slow and then never woke up. Um, they So I think that for any way for West Virginia to win, I think Penn State 
kind of has to have that uh, slow start uh, with West Virginia, obviously contributing to that, and then West Virginia to not let Penn State wake up, wake up. The second thing is for Penn State to have at least one crucial turnover in a bad spot. Not that there's any turnovers in a good spot for an offense, but <laughs> one one turnover that really is a pendulum shifter uh, momentum swing that could really – there were close uh, calls last year, uh, if you remember. Yeah, there were there were some close calls. But uh, I think a big thing, and people, uh, a lot of people think that Penn State uh, is cautious to a fault, or at least had been cautious to a fault with Drew Aller, um, and not letting being too conservative on offense, uh, not having the quarterback on Corker's arm um, enough, and that led to probably James Franklin's most famous press conference exchange of all time, uh, which went viral last fall, but. Um, I think a big advantage to focusing so much on ball security is that um, you don't turn it over as much. And if you don't turn it over against a team that you have more talent than and theoretically are better than like West Virginia, it's hard to see um, an upset happening. So I don't see Penn State uh, having a big turnover. I could see uh, them sleepwalking uh, early on uh, and taking a while to really get going. But I think that Penn State's going to get going eventually. There's too many weapons on this offense. They finally have a coordinator that I think really um, is really suited um, for what Penn State wants to do. Um, and I, I just feel that eventually in that late in that second half, talent is going to win out as it usually does. So um, with all those things, I'll go Penn State 31, uh, West Virginia 20, but it's going to be close for a while. So, yeah. And that would be more similar to last year's game than kind of what Ethan and I are predicting. I think we're kind of leaning toward West Virginia's offense being a lot better. And the issue with last year of them only putting 15 points on the board, if you remember, it took a while for West Virginia. It's almost as like they did not green hadn't started a game in a regular season as the guy. He did come in for JT the year before, but he wasn't the guy, the QB one. They were really trying to gel and mold it almost like an extended practice early on. Then once they got going, they did flirt with it being a game before the second half. I'm assuming they don't have to deal with any of that this year. There's no cobwebs to shake off. There's no practice to be had. There's no shaking off kinks. They know each other. They know the system. Green's now done it for a period of games, now really two years, but certainly last year as a starter, a lot of chemistry. I'd imagine they don't have to ease into the game like that and be down so much early on that they it can be where they're fighting it off early on, even if Penn State does score early. That leads me to West Virginia scoring more, but – I think no matter what the game is, whether Penn State has to put up 30, 40, or do whatever they have to do, like Joe's saying, talent's going to eventually win out. They're going to do what they have to do. And it'll be interesting to me is how West Virginia's defensive line and their defense handles Penn, Penn State on the ground. I mean, Drew Aller's going to throw yards. I think Eric Green's going get, to get yards. I don't think Penn State thinks they're going to shut anybody out. Points are going to be on the board. It's probably going to be a fun and entertaining game to watch and, and for, for Joe and I to cover. But – if Penn State's running backs run all over the place against West Virginia, regardless of what the Mountaineers do on the ground, that probably is it. I, they, I mean, you can't have that. And this will this will be a major test for West Virginia's defensive line and maybe even Penn State's defense. You're going to have two running backs you're dealing with versus just one last year. Jaheim White is complete unknown. And I will tell you, Joe, I mean, he talked about feeling slighted. He, he's somebody who's a three-star recruit in a recruiting base that Penn state looks in, he feels slighted. Yep. So there there's motivating factors all across the board. And, and that'll be interesting. Maybe who's the better running back. Maybe which, which team has the better running back performance could really make a difference here. If you think everything else is going to be even, but a lot of question marks, it's almost really like, and this probably would be insulting to West Virginia fans, but um, as we kind of end, end the show, I almost feel like Joe, Ethan, that West Virginia is almost it's almost a poor man's Penn State in a way. And I mean this team. I'm not talking about historically. Like Garrett Green, the same questions. You got to be smarter, but there's tons of talent. Yes, he's more of a dual threat, but the same things surround him that are on Drew Aller. West Virginia, the two-headed monster on the ground, similar to Penn State. Pressure on the defense to step it up and, and be deeper, but still good. Similar to Penn State. A lot of similarities on what people are looking for in the game, but Penn State just has more five-star kids, more four-star kids. They have more talent. So West Virginia is kind of a poor man's Penn State in terms of the intrigue, the storyline, the rosters, and what this year could be. And that doesn't have to be a slight to West Virginia. That could still be a nine-win West Virginia team. But And maybe Penn State is a national contender. 
as as James James Franklin, Neil Brown, I'm sure Ethan and I know that if West Virginia loses this game, whether it's close or not, Neil Brown's first words will be, we're still a really good team, but that's a national champ contender. He said it last year. He'll say it again to kind of beef up what they are. That's kind of how it feels to me. The WV is kind of a poor man's Penn State, as I'm sure everyone now will be insulted. But that wasn't the goal but of that. But that kind of is where I'm going with that, if either one of you yeah. kind of get what I'm saying there. Yep. And that makes sense. I think that uh, for an upset to happen, a lot of the times, not always, but a lot of the times, the the styles have to be different, right? Uh, the team that's the underdog right. needs to be able to right. do something that would entirely catch the favorite team off guard. That's what we see in basketball um, every single year in March in March Madness yeah. uh, mainly. But uh, when there's two teams, um, Mike, as you mentioned, that do they have the similar strengths, right? Obviously with the two running backs, um, the quarterback is thought of to be a strength for both teams. Uh, both teams uh, are still kind of figuring things out at receiver. Both teams have good tight ends. Um, when so many things are similar, you kind of have to go with uh, the players that are more talented. And I think um, most people would agree that that's uh, Penn State. And I think that's another advantage that they have coming into Saturday. So. All right, Ethan, any final words? I, I guess that'll that'll do it. We're across the board all picking Penn State uh, in this game, but we will see what happens here now days away from kickoff for week one. No, nobody's, nobody's picking the Mountaineers, and I'm sure the program will somehow feel slighted about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure this will get brought up. I'm uh, Joe will be ready for it, too. I'm sure that if West Virginia wins this game, I'll throw it out there, Joe. Number one, if West Virginia wins this game, good luck to either one of us trying to get out of there. So yeah. we're, we're basically sleeping in Morgantown. Probably we're going to find, maybe we'll crash with Ethan. And, 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 yeah. uh, and the second thing will be <laughs> that, that that'll, that that'll be said that Neil Brown will sit there and say, nobody picked us, <laughs> even though the spread kept going towards West Virginia, nobody thought we could do anything and we did it. And Oh man. And then the next week we'll talk about how they're, you know, 15th winningest program in all the history. And it's like, I don't know how this all works, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I mean, in all honesty, everyone is picking Penn state. So that would make sense, but he, he is absolutely going to br hammer that home that no one thinks West Virginia can win this game. Everyone. It'll be a, I'm, you're going to hear a lot of the bill Stewart leave no doubt speech. I'm sure during this. Um, and we will also see if there's a weird universe where West Virginia has a chance to run up that score at the end of the game. And if they do have a chance at a big upset and what they do, <laughs> because we're not going to see this game again for probably a long time, if ever again, with right. the way conferences are realigning. Ren Baker, as Ethan and I know, he's been very clear. He wants one power four on the out of conference schedule. He does not want two anymore. He thinks that was wrong. He wants to play the brawl. I don't see how he fits Penn state when that's even going to be a harder game on there. There's other rivalries to worry about. You got freaking Bama coming up that I have heard from birdies he's trying to get out of. So I just don't see how Penn State and West Virginia meet up again. I don't see how it works, especially with what you do in conference play, mattering so much to get in the playoffs under these current rules. So whoever wins this is it. I mean, if Neil Brown stuffs it down James Franklin and ends up getting a big upset win, there's no get back. So <laughs> there, there's not a three-game series here. That, that is it. And, and we will definitely see what happens uh, in Morgantown. Joe Smeltzer from Nittany Sports Now. Find his coverage there. He will be with me in Morgantown covering this game. Of course, Ethan Bach, I'm Mike Oste. And that'll do it for this preview edition of Mountaineer Report. Make sure to like and subscribe here on YouTube. And also find us everywhere you get your podcasts on Apple, Google Play, TuneIn, etc.